We're grateful to have you with us for today's Fighting Hate from Home, where we will be discussing the recent surge of anti-Semitism that ADL is seeing in response to the current conflict in Israel, Gaza, and the region. Over the past 11 days, Hamas and other terrorist groups have fired thousands of rockets from Gaza into civilian populations of Israel. Israeli military counterstrikes have struck Gaza and extremist violence, both Jewish and Arab, has flared in the streets of Israel. During the crisis, anti-Israel protests have erupted globally and anger against Israel has surged in the United States, Europe, and elsewhere and all too often cross the line from lawful protest into hateful anti-Semitism. Today, Dr. Sharon Nazarian, ADL's Senior Vice President of International Affairs, will lead a discussion with Dr. Dave Rich, Director of Policy for UK-based Community Security Trust, Carol Nuriel, ADL's Regional Director in Israel, and Oren Siegel, Vice President of ADL's Center on Extremism. They will address the urgent need to confront the anti-Semitism and extremism that have been fueled by the conflict in Israel and the region. And now I'm pleased to turn the call over to Sharon. So thank you, Deb, and hello and welcome to everyone um, who's joining us today. Uh, we have an important discussion for you. And as we all are following closely Israel's battle with Hamas, um, it's really been heartbreaking to see the region in turmoil. We all mourn all innocent lives lost to this violence, Israeli and Palestinian alike, and hope that an imminent end to the hostilities will be um, coming about very soon. The current conflict began with small scale tensions inside Israel and Hamas using the opportunity to spread the violence across Israel, Gaza and the region. Within Israel, we're seeing attacks by Israeli citizens, Arabs and Jews on each other. And in the US and Europe, Jewish communities are being targeted and threatened by anti-Israel agitators. We know that tensions in the Middle East often lead to heightened tensions and emotions. And while exchanges of views, even really harsh disagreements are par for the course in civil debate, we disagree especially strongly when we see rhetoric on Israel that goes beyond harsh criticism of its actions and policies to instead blame the entire state of Israel and its ideology of Zionism as illegitimate. While such expressions may not always cross the line into anti-Semitism, depending on the specifics, they do enable an environment where hateful actions against Jews and supporters of Israel are accepted more freely and where anti-Jewish tropes may be normalized. Those who are attacking Jews in the diaspora either physically or rhetorically online with anti-Semitism, aren't simply protesters. They are threats to the physical and emotional safety of Jews. But most of them in our estimation aren't members of extremist groups either. They are people who are engaging in anti-Semitic and therefore illegitimate actions and speech in the context of anti-Israel protests. Those threats intimidate Jewish communities. We hear more about specific examples in a few minutes, but let me just tell you about two of them. Here in my hometown in Los Angeles, a group of men with Palestinian flags attacked a group of Jews eating at a sushi restaurant um, in, a, in what our mayor Eric Garcetti called an organized anti-Semitic attack. And in London, a convoy of cars waving Palestinian flags drove through a Jewish neighborhood and shouted through a loudspeaker, a loudspeaker with an epithet, the Jews raped their daughters. These acts challenge ADL's core mission to make society where Jews can live openly and freely as Jews. And that's true as well for our British partners at the Community Security Trust. While Oren will speak about the US and Dave about the UK, ADL's international affairs team is monitoring such events around the world. We are reporting on anti-Semitic incidents in Europe, Latin America, Canada, Australia, South Africa, and beyond. We're in touch with Jewish communities on all continents to see how ADL can be of help, and we have engaged in advocacy to support them. ADL's international affairs team and our Center on Extremism are producing blogs and op-eds about the conflict and its consequences, 
and encourage you to visit ADL's specially designated homepage to the crisis to find more. We'll get those details um, going um, with Dave and Orrin shortly, but before we do that, I'd like to turn to Carol Nuriel, our director of ADL's Israel office, to first provide us with an update on the situation on the ground. Carol, I turn it over to you. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me, Sharon? Yes, we can. So happy to talk to you this evening from Israel, from the city of Modi'in. Um, I just hope um, that as we speak here, uh, a ceasefire will be announced, so uh, pray with us. It's hard to believe that the current conflict started only 10 days ago. This is true with regards to the fight with Hamas, but we have to take into consideration what led to this. So very briefly, I want to mention that there's been a couple of issues. Some are more, some are less significant, but the common denominator is that they started here within Israel and that the convergence of all of them together showed to be very, very explosive. So just to name them, first of all, an ongoing controversy over a real estate issue in a neighborhood in East Jerusalem. You might have heard of Sheikh Jarrah, when two groups of Jews claimed ownership over houses in which Palestinians have lived for decades. And while this is a private real estate deal and ADL doesn't take a position on private uh, issues, this has much broader ramifications on social inequities, um, not to mention, by the way, the political aspect as well. Second uh, was part of a tense, sort of an, an ongoing tense dynamic between the Israel police and East Jerusalemite Arabs. The police have put barriers in an area where youth used to sit over Ramadan evenings. Um, that created a lot of tensions, a lot of riots, and that might sound minor to people from the outside, but that was very significant for um, East Jerusalemite Arabs. And in addition, the fact that all of it was taking place around dates that for both sides um, symbolize sort of national pride, uh, Jerusalem Day for Jews, end of Ramadan for Arabs. Um, all of it just contributed to a lot of the rising tension. And it all led to extremely violent riots all over the country with Jews being physically attacked. Um, synagogues desecrated, a lot of vandalism all around. We've seen hotels, restaurants uh, vandalized. Unfortunately, this week a Jew um, that was attacked in the city of Lod died from his wounds. And let's hope it's gonna be the first and the last victim of this um, terrible, terrible violence. Um, and I have to say that these ad attacks of Arabs against Jews weren't left unanswered with counterattacks by Jewish extremists this time and all of it led to the police announcing an emergency situation in a major city in Israel, in Lod, and even an intention to have soldiers in the cities, which we have not seen, uh, thank God, but uh, it could have been um, the situation. And at the same time, Hamas has joined the party. The fact that Hamas has launched missiles to Israel at one point should be of much concern to those who care about peace here in the region. And the reason is that most of the tension initially has been around the centrality of Jerusalem to the Palestinian national struggle. And what we're seeing here now is the Hamas trying to claim ownership over the issue of Jerusalem and thus further um, complicating the, the situation on the ground, which has been already very, very complicated. And I'd like to uh, continue to another point, but let me just close with, with summing up my personal experience from this current crisis, because it leads from Jerusalem um, to the Gaza conflict. So I can tell you that as someone who was born and raised in Jerusalem, I miss the days when, you know, we would go to the old city and visit with friends over, you know, just coffee and, and visit freely. As a resident of the city of Modi'in, also as a mother of three teenagers, I can tell you that the crisis and all of the sirens and all of the rockets we've had will most probably leave a mark on all of us. We've stayed at home for 10 days now and it's very stressful and life has stopped, just stopped completely for residents of the South. And as someone who's been working in the field of shell living in Israel for over 20 years, I have a lot of mixed feelings about the work that needs to be done, 
about the trust that needs to be restored, but also about the need to look at the reality as it is and really face um, the challenges that we have. And this brings me to the next point I'd like to mention, which is that with or without Hamas, there are core issues that stand in the way of coexistence in Israel, especially in Israeli cities where Jews and Arabs live together. So even when this current crisis is over, and hopefully with this ceasefire soon, we still need to address some of the core issues, which include um, social um, economical inequities. The national Palestinian identity, that's an issue um, which is which is very hard to deal with from an Israeli perspective, from an Israeli a perspective that sees Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. That's that's a challenge, but we have to. But also other um, urban processes that have been stuck for years um, in the Arab sectors and they have to move forward. So I think that a lot of the public's surprise and also frustration was because all of it came um, at a time when Israeli-Arab relations seemed to be moving in the right direction. So with more willingness on both sides, not only on both sides, uh, uh, Arabs and Jews, but the extreme of both sides, which is even more surprising to cooperate politically. And not only that, also in a time when the positive role of Arabs in helping society was acknowledged publicly. So if it is during the, the COVID pandemic, um, after the tragedy in Meron, when 45 ultra-Orthodox Jews died in a stampede and Arabs were just helping as medical staff, but also opening their homes in the north um, for Jews to come and relax and, and, and rest a little bit before they continue to Shabbat. So we, as Israelis, have to recalculate the path now and find a way to restore the trust that has been sort of broken in, in the last um, couple of weeks. And I feel that it is doable, but we really need the commitment of a lot of forces around. And, and I think that um, that includes also the government. For us as ADL in Israel, we're committed to double down on our efforts of social cohesion. In the last four years, I'm proud to say that we have become a leading player as a convener, also using our educational programming and our voice on issues of, so of social cohesion. Um, now is just the time to do that even more. And this is a constructive uh, approach to a very, very challenging situation. But lastly, I do want to mention that this conflict also highlights ADL's role in calling out extremists on both sides. They have used this current situation as a way to promote their extremist agenda. And uh, for example, the Jewish far-right um, nationalist group of Lehava and others, so as a counter reaction to them getting closer to the center on both sides, I think that we have to play a constructive role in denormalizing their agenda and their activities. Turning it back to you, Sharon. Thank you, Carol, so much. And thank you for your leadership. Um, we continue to wish you and the rest of the ADL team on the ground safety during these challenging times and we hope that the ceasefire will bring you some rest and some quiet. We know that you've been running in and out of shelters for the last 10 days. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dave Rich. Um, he's a director of policy at the Community Security Trust. Um, CST is a UK Jewish organization that advises and represents the UK Jewish community on matters relating to anti-Semitism, terrorism, and extremism. Uh, Dave is the author of the 2016 book, The Left's Jewish Problem, Jeremy Corbyn, Israel and Antisemitism. And he writes regularly about antisemitism, anti-Zionism and extremism. Dave, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Sharon. And um, good afternoon to everybody or good evening from where I am in London. Uh, it's always a pleasure to work with the ADL, but especially at times like this that are so difficult for all of us, I think it's so important and, and uh, rewarding to actually connect with each other um, across different countries and different Jewish communities and, and share our experiences. As Sharon said, that there's been a huge increase in anti-Semitism uh, in the United Kingdom in the last two weeks since the tensions and the kind of low, low level violence in Jerusalem really escalated into open conflict um, between uh, Israel and Gaza. 
Um, this was no surprise. I'm sure it came as no surprise to any of us because we've all been here before in 2014 and in 2009. Uh, but the fact that it's predictable doesn't make it any easier to take when these things happen. Um, my organization, CST, takes reports of anti-Semitic incidents and hate crimes from people across the Jewish community. We give them victim support uh, and advice, and we work with the police. The number of incidents being reported into us each day in the, next, the last two weeks has been running around five times what it normally is. Uh, it's been a massive, massive increase. We've had to draft in extra staff just to deal with the calls. Um, we've had to increase our security operations in the Jewish community just to give that reassurance. Um, and there is something about the nature of this anti-Semitic uh, reaction to what's happening in Israel that um, I think is really worth delving into a little bit. Um, what tends to happen is that the type of anti-Semitic hate crime going on changes. The language changes um, up until today, up until the end of the working day today, we had recorded uh, 191 anti-Semitic incidents in the last two weeks, of which 170 made a direct reference to what's going on in Israel and Gaza. And what we're seeing a lot of is people driving through Jewish neighborhoods shouting free Palestine, shouting stuff about Israel, waving Palestinian flags, but doing it in a way that is deliberately intended to intimidate the Jewish people on the street in those neighborhoods. Sharon mentioned there was one of these kind of convoys of cars that drew uh, a huge amount of national attention and I believe international attention because the, the nature of the anti-Semitic abuse being shouted out was so utterly vile. Uh, and on this occasion, it was captured on video by someone, uh, a Jewish person overlooking the street who, who videoed it. Um, and those people have been arrested uh, and there have been national condemnations from, from politicians from all sides. But this phenomenon of cars, either individually or in groups, driving through Jewish neighbourhoods, it's become a common thing. It's happening every single day at the moment. Um, there have been you know, a few of these today that won't reach the news. Um, but it's going on and it, it has an incredibly powerful intimidating impact on the Jewish community. Um, and we have all these anti-Semitic hate crimes going on. And another part of the picture is massive, massive protests on the streets of London and Manchester and Leeds and Glasgow and lots of other smaller towns and cities around the country. Protests and demonstrations and marches for Palestine. Now, these protests are legitimate, right? It's normal political protesting, but they're also very angry. And what you get within these protests and on the fringes of them is people carrying anti-Semitic placards or make chanting anti-Semitic chants. Not the majority of people, but they're there, they're on the fringes and they get publicity. And this is coming at a time where we've had a year and a half where we've basically not seen anyone on the streets in Britain. We're just coming out of lockdown at the moment. So again, for the Jewish community to see very infrequent political protests, you know, there was a bit of protest around a kind of Black Lives Matter, a bit of climate protest, but really not very much. And really our city centres and our town centres have been empty. So all of a sudden, tens of thousands of people on the streets. And they're on the streets because they're so angry about Israel in a way they never get angry about anything else is it creates and it feeds a, a really alarming atmosphere for the Jewish community. And the third part of this piece is what's happening on social media. And I said we've seen this before in 2014 and in 2009, but the difference now is that social media is much more pervasive than it was during those two conflicts in Gaza. And it's much more image-based and it's much more fleeting. Um, and the, uh, you know, the 2014, the social media aspects of the 2014 Gaza conflict played out on Facebook and Twitter. At the moment, it's playing out on Instagram and TikTok. It's different. It, it works in a different way. And one of the ways that it's different is that it affects young people much more. 
Um, and certainly everything we're hearing from Jewish teenagers and Jewish students is that they are overwhelmed by this sudden discovery that all of their non-Jewish peers and all of their non-Jewish friends are, are, have a fundamentally different understanding of even whether Israel should exist and what it's for and why it's there and how it behaves than they do. And it's really shaken a lot of young Jewish people who are finding themselves not just isolated, but actually singled out and expected to join the campaign, join the movement or express their position or just get bullied. Um, and, and, and part of the, this is happening partly because who is it who's setting this narrative on, on these social media platforms? The narrative is being set by global influencers who again were not really such a phenomenon in 2014 social media influencers, uh, footballers, sports stars, athletes, rappers, musicians, models, all posting about it, tweeting about it with varying degrees of ignorance. And then teenagers around the world pick it up and repeat it, because of course they do, because these are the people they follow. This is the movement, this is the trend for this week. And you put all this together, and this is my final point really. And, and we are reminded of a truth that is always the case in these conflicts, which is that the discourse and the narrative and the activism that happens in our countries around Israel and Palestine has a much greater impact on community relations in our countries than it ever does or ever will on the Israeli-Palestinian arena and on the fundamentals of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It won't change much over there, what's going on here. But it really is affecting things here and it really is affecting how the Jewish community feels in Britain right now. And, you know, please God, there will be a ceasefire. Um, all these people commenting on the, on the conflict will move on, but the impacts and the scars will be left on our Jewish communities and will take much longer to receive. Thank you, Dave, for those sobering um, and really important analysis that you're offering us. Um, this point, I'd like to turn over to uh, Oren Siegel, ADL's Vice President um, for Center on Extremism, to kind of give us more of a U.S. perspective on what we're seeing. Oren, over to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Sharon. Um, so as this crisis continues, uh, we are documenting a disturbing array of anti-Semitic anti-Semitic activity, uh, as, as Dave Rich mentioned, especially content on social media and online platforms from Twitter and Facebook to TikTok and, and Instagram and, and just so much more. This includes explicit anti-Semitic messages like praise for Hitler, posts promoting tropes about Jewish control or demonizing all Jews. And all too often, we have to remind ourselves, we have seen how online narratives and campaigns like this play out in the real world. We simply don't have a luxury to just ignore them. So for example, an analysis we did of Twitter in the days following the outbreak showed more than 17,000 tweets, which were using variations of the phrase, Hitler was right. That data, by the way, was just a sampling, a fraction of the full picture of the anti-Semitism out there, especially when we account for the fact that we didn't even analyze tweets in every language um, that people are using. So this outbreak of anti-Semitism online comes at a moment of historically high anti-Semitic incidents on the ground. We reported on this last month when we released our annual audit of anti-Semitic incidents. It also comes at a time where Jews worldwide are feeling particularly vulnerable, right? Vulnerable to being scapegoated by those who conflate criticism of the Israeli government with criticism of all Jews. We have been receiving reports from concerned community members, from parents whose children are observing anti-Semitism in the context of Israel on their social feeds many for the first time, and are unsure about how to respond. How do they make sense out of it all? Perhaps unsurprisingly, we're also seeing extremists weigh in, taking advantage of a crisis to elevate their particular hateful worldview on social media. In many cases, not only calling for the destruction of the Jewish state, 
but glorifying genocidal posts calling for Jews to be gassed. To be clear, these extremists are not necessarily affiliated with the thousands of protesters we have seen take the streets around the world and even in the United States over the last 10 days or so. In fact, we've tracked 185 of those protests thus far here in the United States. And there were some expressions of anti-Semitism there too, primarily on the fringes. While the majority of protests have stayed within the lines of free and civil discourse, the anti-Semitic messages that we have observed include signs that invoke the classic accusation that Jews are responsible for killing Jesus, Holocaust analogies, and in some cases, explicit support for terrorist organizations like Hamas and Hezbollah. So we have documented many of these incidents in our microblog, which we are updating every single day. And while these expressions have not gone, uh, gone unnoticed thus far, these protests have not reached the levels of vitriol we have seen during previous crises, like in 2014, on the ground. Now, part of this may be tactical, especially as Jews make up a portion of those who are protesting, but part of me believes that this is also because social media has become the platform or ecosystem of platforms for the most vile anti-Semitism with little or no accountability. People just feel more free to express such hatred in those spaces. So in closing, we are concerned when blame is assigned to Jews as a whole for the policies of the Israeli government. We are concerned when protests against those policies occur in front of Jewish institutions, as we saw in Skokie, Illinois, where a group of 20 or so uh, demonstrators chanted from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free across the street from the Temple Beth Israel Synagogue. We are also concerned about the use of Holocaust analogies that demonize Zionists as a whole. Describing all Zionists as Nazis, the epitome of evil, implicitly demonizes millions of Jews around the world who identify as Zionists, regardless of their position on the current conflict. All of this is also dangerous if it's left unchecked. As Sharon noted, we have responded to a report of Jewish individual being beaten in Los Angeles and Jews being intimidated on the street by individuals in cars carrying Palestinian flags. We have received 193 reports in the week after the crisis began, up from 131 the previous week. We are investigating each and every one of these incidents and will continue to provide support to those communities and expose those narratives and messages that can drive hatred and violence. That's what we do. Thank you, Oren, for that. And really, really important information you're sharing with us and the great work of um, COE. So at this point, I'd like to invite both Dave and Oren to join me on the screen. And we'll dive a little deeper into the antisemitism and extremism um, they both referenced uh, in their presentation. So Dave, maybe I'll start with you. And I just want to dive, dive right in and talk about uh, how does the current crisis affect the relationship between Jewish and Muslim communities in Britain? We know that these are vulnerable relationships. They're very sensitive and delicate. I can only imagine what's happening now, given that uh, CST really does monitor and does a lot of outreach. Where do you see the situation right now in terms of Jewish Arab relations, Jewish Muslim relations, excuse me, in Britain? Um, I mean, we, we kind of have to wait and see in a way, you know, th there are a lot of very positive relations in uh, Jewish and Muslim communities. There are a lot of problems, of course, there's a lot of anti-Semitism within Muslim communities, there's a lot of Islamophobia within Jewish communities, but there's a lot of good connections, a lot of good cooperation. You know, at CST, we have a program where we, we teach and advise uh, places of worship from other faith communities about how to do security. And we've given security advice uh, and support to uh, a lot of mosques and a lot of Muslim communities around the country in the last few years uh, who are facing threats from the British far right and from others. Um, 
But obviously what's going on at the moment, when we look at the, the, the really angry protests on the streets and when we look at a lot of the, the incitement going on online, a lot of it is coming from within Muslim communities in Britain or from within elements in Muslim communities in Britain. And we kind of have to see, wait and see how that plays out. And the other thing is there are, of course, uh, there are groups and there are, there are individuals uh, in extremist networks in Britain who hate the idea of Muslims and Jews working together and are constantly pressuring uh, and bullying uh, British Muslim organisations uh, not to work with the Jewish community. They try and undermine interfaith by claiming it's all a Zionist plot to, um, to infiltrate Muslim communities. Um, in fact, you know, famously, there was, well, there was one wonderful charity event where Muslims and Jews got together in a mosque to make chicken soup for a local homeless shelter. And um, a, whole, a whole load of extremist uh, organizations complained that this, you know, this was Zionist chicken soup and it was all part of a, of a plot. And what's going on at the moment, these people are using this situation. They're manipulating what's going on uh, and, and exploiting what's going on in Israel and Gaza to say, you know, the Jewish community are all Zionists. They all support this. You mustn't work with them. And they're trying to pressure people to move away from those interfaith networks. So. I think we need to be strong. We may need to get out of the, the immediate heat of the situation we're in and see what damage has been done and then try and rebuild those contacts as best we can. Thank you for that. Um, Oren, maybe kind of referencing what you mentioned about um, all the hot Holocaust and Nazi reference in, in the um, anti-Semitic incidents that you're monitoring. Do you think that these comparisons really come out of a place of ignorance, or is it really an intentional demonization of Israel and as Jews, as a, as a you know outline, outline of that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a really important question, and and it, to some degree, I would say kind of both. Um, you know, polls have shown that knowledge of the Holocaust has been declining for years, right? Um, and so it's possible that some protesters are are simply not fully aware. Of the extents, uh, of the extent of the the murderous uh, agenda of the Nazis, believe it or not. Um, but I, I don't think that's all of the answer, right? Um, there's also a lot of misinformation about what is happening um, on the ground, which may lend people to also sort of make analogies that are unhelpful. At, at the end of the day, as I mentioned earlier, we're concerned about demonizing Zionists as a whole because when you start comparing. Zionists to the most murderous regime, as I said before, you are intentionally or unintentionally demonizing millions of Jews who identify as Zionists, or in some cases are called Zionists, whether they self-identify as such. And that, um, again, creates an atmosphere where isolating and attacking those because of their beliefs regardless of what their opinions are about what's happening in the Middle East, are fair game. It's always dangerous. Thanks, Lauren. Um, Dave, as you look around the community now um, through these difficult couple of weeks, um, do you see any opportunity for allyship and, and collaboration? Where is the community turning to the Jewish community in the UK um, for support and for allyship during this difficult period? Where are, the, where are the politicians? Where are others? How, where do you see that really coming from? You know, the support from politicians uh, has really been excellent. Um, and uh, it's come from all sides uh, of the political spectrum, all political parties. The, the, the leaders of, of both the main parties, Labour and the Conservatives uh, of the government, have been incredibly uh, supportive in public. There's been lots of meetings with the Prime Minister, with the Home Secretary, with senior police officers. The operational support on the ground from police in, in the areas where there's large Jewish communities has also been fantastic um, in terms of extra resources and extra patrolling and responding to uh, hate crime reports and calls and so on. So that side of it is actually really good. The kind of official institutional support and allyship is really good. Where I think we're missing a piece is across civil society. You know, across civil society, I think whenever anti-Semitism is in any way connected to attitudes towards Israel, I think there are there are large swathes of certainly liberal progressive civil society that are um, 
kind of absent. Their, their support is just not there in the way it would be if this anti-Semitism was coming from the far right. Uh, and that's been the case for a long time. And I, and I think that's the case now as well. I think we would say the same probably in the US. Um, Oren, turning back to you, um, the kinds of chants that you've been documenting, your team has been documenting, for example, a lot of uh, research has been saying uh, that the one chant that's been really heard in the US and around the world, um, Kai Bar, Kai Bar, Oju, the army of Muhammad is returning. What do you take of this, that there's kind of a, now a consistency um, worldwide and in the US obviously, around chants that are now being seen across different cities around the world and in the US? Yeah, so, so let me explain the, the, the chant a little bit. And, and by the way, you know, these are the types of chants we have seen at such protests whenever there's a, a crisis in the Middle East for, for years, um, as far back as I can remember, you know, monitoring anti-Semitism, which has been quite a while now. Um, these have been a staple at many of the protests, both in the United States and, and elsewhere. It's a reference to the Battle of Kaibar, which is described in uh, Islamic sources as a military clash between Jews and the armies of the Prophet Muhammad in the seventh century. Uh, the Jews in that lost the battle. And according to many Islamic uh, sources, it, the battle actually ended with the execution of Jews, including women and children. So when protesters used that um, and uh, chant during these rallies um, to evoke this battle, you can understand how some Jews who are aware would view that as a potential threat against them. Um, and the fact that the chant again refers to Jews rather than Israelis underscores this fact that anti-Israel sentiment often can find a way to manifest itself in opposition to Jews in general. And that's why one of the reasons that we particularly feel it's important to call that out, um, no matter where it is, because I think one of the concerns that we have seen is that people don't always even recognize anti-Semitism anymore, whether it's a pro and understanding what's being said, whether it's to, to Dave's point about some of the images and meme culture on social media, right? To even identify what it is because you're not familiar. And that's why we're here to educate people about the meanings behind these slogans and images. And so maybe a final question to both of you. We have lots of listeners on and um, I think there's a real importance to share with them. If they encounter an anti-Semitic incident, online or in person, what should they be doing? Maybe Dave, you can go first again. I think hopefully we'll have listeners from all over the world listening. What is it that you recommend um, for a UK audience and then Oren to you for US um, participants? Sure, um, in the UK, if you experience or witness any kind of anti-Semitism online or offline, please report it to CST. Uh, you can do that via our website or, or you can phone us, all the details are on there. We have a 24 seven uh, emergency number that can respond in, in real time. Um, we can't deal with anti-Semitism if it's not reported. If it just goes on out there and it's not reported to anyone, it will carry on growing. Every report we get, we can investigate. We can make sure the police investigate. Uh, we can try and make sure this applies anywhere in the world. We have to try and make sure there is a cost to being anti-Semitic, whatever that cost may be. But the start of the process of, of enforcing that cost on, on anti-Semites is reporting stuff. And that's what needs to be done. Thanks, Dave. Oren? Yeah, so I, I will say that there, there's two uh, vehicles that we've made available for reporting. Um, one is uh, our, on our website, and this is true through our regional sites, but also our, our national website, um, where you can report uh, an incident as it occurs, right? The, this is frankly the, um, the lifeblood of the audit of anti-Semitic incidents that we put out every year. It really relies on community to let us know what's happening. And I've said this before, but I, th I think it's worth repeating. I think at a time where people feel particularly vulnerable, they don't know exactly what they can do to stop something that seems way beyond their control. The one thing that people can do is report an incident when you see it, right? That data is valuable, not just for our own knowledge, but you know, it, the way to mitigate threats, the way to create policies that change those threats 
is to demonstrate to people that you can resource to that by providing them the data, letting them know what's happening. And that's what we do at ADL with that information every day. We use it to encourage people to fight back against hate and to change policies as needed. And so report an anti-Semitic incident through our web form in particular. The second thing I wanted to mention are uh, cyber safety action guide, right? This is a product that comes out of our Center on Technology and Society. And what this guide enables you to do is look at the terms of services of the platforms that you or your children or your grandchildren are using, where most people are more likely to come across anti-Semitism and report it to those companies. They need to do a better job of dealing with the anti-Semitism and hatred on their own platforms. And what we're doing is trying to make it a little bit easier for those users to report. And that way we can hold those companies accountable as well. Thank you, Oren, that's really helpful. And just for the audience, if you look on our Twitter handle, um, we've also lifted that cyber safety action guide. So it's a resource for you. I wanna thank you both um, on my behalf. I wanna turn it over to Deb now for some audience Q and A, but really appreciate you both being on. Thank you. Thank you all. I think that was frightening if illuminating. Uh, and admittedly, I'm gonna tell you right now, the questions that we're seeing in the chat, they are, they are not easy. Uh, and I think they're you know, a combination of the same questions that have been asked for decades and decades along with uh, mixed in with things that we're seeing much more recently today. So I'm gonna jump in and uh, I'll invite all four of you to turn your cameras on. Sharon, this is certainly where we could use your expertise. You've been playing moderator today, but uh, it hasn't shown off your greatest asset. So I'm gonna put you on the spot first. We've received by far the most questions about how do we respond to the extreme anti-Israel sentiment? So we've talked about it a little bit in terms of writing to the platforms, et cetera, but what can folks be doing to combat you know, different publications and media outlets, as well as things from celebrities and influencers where they're spreading misinformation. Like, what can we even do to begin to combat that? That's, that's a really, really important and difficult uh, question to answer. And I would say it takes all of us. It takes the ADL to be there every day, calling out what we're seeing when it crosses the line from criticism of Israeli policy to actual rhetoric that demonizes all of Israel, all Israelis, and by way, oftentimes all Jews. But it also takes all of you out there in your own communities. We're hearing about, you know, completely apolitical spaces such as mommy and me forums, online forums, where even in those forums, these issues are being brought in and, and they're, you know, di creating divisions within um, moms groups. And entering this language and this rhetoric and this point finger pointing in those spaces. So what I recommend is try to be informative. There's a lot of misinformation. If you see misinformation, call it out. It's good to have important good sources um, for truthful information. And we know now how difficult that is in our world to talk about truthful information. But hopefully ADL can be a resource for you for that. Um, and it takes really an up, top down and bottom up approach. It takes all of us. And I think we talked about the, the impact on youth. Probably that's the most heartbreaking part of this crisis is where we see middle schoolers, high schoolers who are on TikTok for either learning to dance or putting their own post on, being exposed to hateful rhetoric that in the past they would have been just protected from. We as parents would not have allowed them to see that and now they're seeing it. So it takes all of us to, I think, call it out, to report it, whether it's on the platforms or in person. And we have to each do our own um, role here. We have to play roles here, all of us. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, Dr. Rich, Oren, anything that you would add to that? Yeah, it's certainly not an easy question. And, and the next one I'm gonna ask you is also not easy. So uh, I apologize in advance for that. We're asking you to solve decades worth of problems in one hour's worth of call. But the same question is coming up around college students on campus. What should they be doing? What can they be doing? I, I just saw in the chat that someone posted that their daughter was going out last night and had been wearing a very prominent Jewish star and took it off. 
before she left. And her mother asked, you know, was I wrong to ask her to do that? But there's real fear. We see what's happening in Los Angeles. So. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think those fears are warranted. I'm a mother of three and I have uh, adult children and I have a high schooler. And I would not in any way, um, you know, uh, fault anyone for wanting to prote uh, protect their children. This is a difficult time. Um, I think steps that we can take to protect our children, but also inform them. I hate to feel that fear will wi win here. But I do think on campuses, there's already systems in place, whether it's the Hillel's on campus, whether it's outreach to administrators when lines are crossed. And ADL has been very much at the forefront of that through all our regional offices. There are communities here that are empowered. So we shouldn't just feel like we're embattled and we have no resources and we have no voice. I think it's important for our youth, for our college age students to feel emboldened and to feel that their identity and their political voice should not be repressed and suppressed here. We have to balance that out with the safety and precaution that they should take. And I think that is warranted. But at the same time, I hope that they're reaching out to the resources, whether it's on campus or it's ADL or a myriad of other organizations that are there to support students. And look, we show up when we see things, um, lines that are crossed. We reach out to the presidents, we reach out to the boards, and we galvanize. And we hope that students also feel that they have power and they have a voice. And fear should not be the overarching um, attitude here. We should feel emboldened and, and strong and to say that when lines are crossed, it should be called out. It's very true. Thank you for that. So several other questions have played with themes of the different uh, extremism that we've been seeing here in the United States, uh, especially around uh, January 6th and the insurrection. So, so Oren, this question over to you. Has QAnon played a role in this anti-Israel sentiment? And do you find that the online environment further aggravates and further spreads that? Well, that's a great question. I thought for sure this would be uh, the first webinar without the insurrection coming up, but you know, there's always hope for the future. Um, so, you know, QAnon currently is going through a bit of a shift right? The election didn't turn out the way QAnon supporters wanted to. Um, other conspiracy theories are sort of taking hold. Social media presence is changing. Um, but, you know, I would say the degree to which some QAnon followers over a period of time before and after the insurrection, before this crisis, helped normalize certain conspiracy theories about Jews. Um, sort of were able to get into online spaces where disinformation and sort of absurd ideas became normalized, that sets a foundation for, you know, what we're seeing now in terms of people buying into some of the conspiracy theories around Jews or, or Israel in the current context. So I'm not going to say, like, right now that QAnon is a very sort of specific role in spreading sort of anti-Israel or anti-Semitic animus, no more than you know, perhaps it usually has. Um, but I will say that every generation, and by generation, I mean every couple of months in this day and age, that an extremist movement sort of normalizes um, anti-Semitism and other forms of hate, the next generation benefits from it. And I, I actually think that's why we're seeing this explosion of anti-Semitism online now. Thank you for that, Oren. Comprehensive and always a little bit upsetting whenever we hear from you, but thank you. I, I get that all the time from family, yeah. <laughs> uh, Dr. Rich, uh, this question is for you. Um, I understand that there is some draft legislation under discussion in the UK on cyber, uh, on cyber hate. Do you think that's gonna help in this scenario? I hope it helps. Um, this is true. This is a, a policy process that's been going on in the UK for two or three years now uh, called online harms or online safety. And the idea is to create an entire regulatory framework for the internet in the UK, basically. And there will be an independent regulator uh, and all sorts of, of legal uh, kind of requirements for websites and platforms and so on. Um, social media is is 
the environment where all this happens now. You know, any aspect of anti-Semitism that we look at today, there is some online element to it, uh, all the way from the, the kind of uh, the anti-Jewish terrorism that we've seen in, in North America and in Europe and in other places in recent years. Every offender has an online footprint. Um, the kind of incitement that we're seeing at the moment, uh, all the, the really extreme anti-Israel hatred Social media is the engine that drives it all, it binds the networks together. And this is just looking at our little problem at the moment. We look at any other problem, whether we're talking about, about child sexual exploitation or uh, other forms of abuse, organized crime. I mean, there are so many different elements where the internet cannot, uh, uh, cannot be allowed to continue as just this free for all where companies are just left to regulate themselves or rather not regulate themselves. Um, and there is cross-party uh, agreement in, in Britain now. I think that regulation needs to happen. Will it help? Well, you know, uh, that depends on whether it's done properly. And as ever, uh, these, these proposals can start out strong and then get watered down and watered down. So by the time they end up on the statute book, the, the, the powers that were promised aren't really there. We're doing what we can to make sure hate and extremism are very much part of this uh, policy thinking because it, 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 it is an absolutely crucial part of the picture. Thank you for that. So Sharon, I, I would say uh, the next most popular question that I consistently am seeing pop up in the chat is how ADL is addressing the anti-Zionism and anti-Israel sentiments we're seeing loudly proclaimed from the left. Uh, can you speak a bit to what we're doing in response to that? So first of all, we um, are trying to be educators here. Um, while we are very cognizant that, you know, pro-Palestinian uh, speech is protected speech, um, we are being very nuanced and careful about when such um, language crosses the line into anti-Semitism. So our specialists, such as members of um, Oren's team and my team, International Affairs team, we spend a lot of time putting information out on our landing page through our blogs, where we really delineate between what is legitimate criticism of Israeli policy and what is anti-Semitic and what is anti-Israel and delegitimization of Israel in a way that is construed as um, anti-Semitic or leading to anti-Semitic um, views and environments. So some of the examples you heard from Oren and from Dave regarding incidents that we've talked about, we can say that what happened in Los Angeles two nights, two nights ago on La Cienega Boulevard, 10 minutes from my house, was an example of what people are seeing online, which is a delegitimization of the state of Israel as a state, turning into provocateurs, taking that action, going on the streets of Los Angeles, looking for spaces where Jews congregate, and then attacking them. So that's where we see the very clear dotted lines here that connect behavior and rhetoric that delegitimizes Israel, turning into actual violent acts against Jews. So we know that what happens in the Middle East doesn't stay there. You've heard this from our experts. We know that Jews in the diaspora around the world oftentimes are held responsible for what goes on in the Middle East. We hear this from our partner communities in Chile, in South Africa, across Europe, that those Jewish communities are held hostage to what uh, politics, crises, military or warfare that's going on in the Middle East. And so that's what we at ADL do. And we talk about how that um, infringement of the security and safety of Jewish communities, whether in America or around the world, cannot be crossed. And that's a lot of the work that my team does in elevating and informing our audiences about when those lines are crossed. Thank you for that, Sharon. Uh, I'm afraid that we are actually out of time for today. So I'd like to thank Dr. Nazarian, Dr. Rich, Oren for being with us today and for speaking so candidly and so expertly to this audience. I'd also like to remind everyone on the line that this call has been recorded and will be available on ADL's YouTube channel later today. 
and the resources that you've seen dropped into the chat will also be circulated along with the recording in a follow up email. Otherwise, I'd like to wish you a good rest of your day and hope that you continue to stay healthy and safe and we will see you at our next Fighting Hate From Home next month. Keep your eye on your inbox. Thanks so much for being with us today.